On the 6th of June 1944, the Allies landed in Normandy. After Operation Zitadel, from the summer of 1943 until the spring of 1944, Heavy Zapt 503, as part of Army Group South, was involved in constant rearguard fighting through the Ukraine and Romania to the Hungarian border. Graf Kaganek, RCO, was awarded the Knight's Cross with oak leaves. The Abteilung had now arrived at Ordruf Troop Training Depot in the Harz Mountains for rest and recuperation. I rejoined the unit at the beginning of June 1944. Hauptmann Fromm had been appointed its new commander, while Scherf, now also with the rank of Hauptmann and the wearer of the Knight's Cross, remained in command of three company. I found that many old faces were no longer around. No three company was the last of the Abteilung to arrive at Ordruf from the Eastern Front, and most of its men were now on leave. Hauptmann Fromm employed me at first as officer for special duties at Abteilung HQ. I had to prepare for the visit of the Inspector General of Panzer Troops, General Oberst Guderian, and as his liaison officer ensure the smooth running of his programme. On the 15th of June he was a guest at our officers' party. During the course of the evening he came to our lieutenant's table and spoke gravely about the situation on the western and eastern fronts. He made it clear to us how difficult the task was going to be for us personally in our probable area of defence at the invasion front in France. If we do not succeed in destroying the enemy bridgehead in the next 14 days, the war is lost for us. I could not get the General Lobest's words out of my head. On the 14th of June, the V Weapons Offensive on London had begun. Our propaganda ministry went to town, boasting of immense damage inflicted on England. This would bring the turn of the tide in the West, and more V weapons would be coming. After the V1, the V2 with an even more devastating effect. In the fifth year of war, people were more sceptical and no longer took such things at face value. The media put rumours into circulation, and people said, no smoke without fire, they wouldn't have just made it all up. People liked to talk themselves into believing it, but now the fact that the Allies had been able to gain such a firm foothold in Normandy in such a short time had given them food for thought. And the Allies' air supremacy. Where was the Luftwaffe? Had Goering dried up? At the same time, on the 22nd of June, the Soviets launched their major offensive against Army Group Center. It was appalling how the German front crumbled. We tried not to think about it. The imminent readiness of the Abteilung for the coming battle made the fullest demands of us. One Sunday in nearby Erfurt, we watched the final game of the 1944 German football championship. It was played on a park pitch, not in a stadium as it would be nowadays. I wasn't interested in football, but it was good to get away from the troop training ground for a day. It seems almost unbelievable that football was not then what it is today. The favourite sport was field handball, which was a great festive occasion for all companies in the hours set aside for sport. On 26-27 June 1944, the Abteilung was listed for transfer to the invasion front in eight trains. I commanded one of these. On the evening of the 27th of June, my train was first for loading at Ordruf and was due to pull out at six o'clock next morning, my 22nd birthday. After we finished loading, I drove to Erfurt in the VW Kubelwagen. I had a chance meeting with an old acquaintance a few days previously, and he wanted to wish me well and celebrate my birthday with a few drinks. I set my alarm for four o'clock, and it failed to go off. I awoke at 5.30, 30 minutes before the scheduled departure of my train from Ordruf. It was a crazy drive. From far away, looking towards the goods yard, I saw a great cloud of smoke rising from the locomotive which was frequently letting off steam. I could see the transport still standing there. Ten minutes later we took the last bend at top speed, roared up to the loading ramp and came to a stop with a squeal of brakes. I jumped out of the car, told the impatient railway official that he could show the driver the green flag and leapt onto a wagon. The train was set in motion at once. Everything had turned out well again. Once more, we were the leading transport with priority over all the others. Systematic Allied air attacks had disrupted the railway network repeatedly in the initial stages of the invasion. Often we waited for hours in a tunnel if the aerial situation came to a head. 
Again and again there were long detours whenever wrecked bridges or railway installations made it necessary. All the transports finally reached their destinations undamaged, but not until 2 and the 3rd of July. We were unloaded at Dreux, about 70 km west of Paris, then moved by night via verneuil laigle argentan falaise to our future operational area east of Caen. It was not possible to move by day because of enemy fighter-bomber activity, and so every night, depending on the weather, we took to the road from 23 o'clock until 3 o'clock, then sought shelter in a wood until the following night. We were always happy to see the sky overcast because this prevented enemy aircraft from flying. On one of our nocturnal runs, we passed a V-1 launch site. The flying bombs rose into the skies, trailing fiery tails and disappeared westwards. It was very impressive, but would this bring about the turn of the tide in our favour, or be decisive in the outcome of the war? Or was this just the propaganda ministry merely buoying up our hopes? I had my doubts, for until then the V-1 had not changed anything. When would the V-2 be coming? This was allegedly a much more powerful and accurate weapon. Was this all fantasy, or was there really a miracle weapon? If this was only propaganda in order to keep us fighting to the last, then it would be the greatest crime imaginable that had ever been committed against the German soldier. But I preferred not to believe it yet. Heavy Psapt 503 joined LX-65 Army Corps on the 7th of July 1944. Next day we were attached to Panzer Regiment 22 of 21 Panzer Division, which until then had only had a Panzer IV Abteilung. In association with the latter, we now formed the Armoured Reserve, which would be held in readiness for any eventuality immediately behind the front line. While the regiment lay at Traun, we were assigned to the Emmyville area. Up to the time of our arrival at Emmyville, the situation on the invasion front had developed as follows. 21 divisions of the Wehrmacht and Waffen-SS were defending a front 140 km long between the Orn estuary and the western coast of the Cotentin Peninsula. Our losses were increasing. The British had occupied a 25 km bridgehead east of the Orne since the first day of the invasion. A fixed front line with trenches had not developed, and the front was in constant flux as a result of limited attacks, defensive successes and pinning down operations by both sides. The Allied forces had not yet been able to achieve a decisive breakthrough, but it was obvious to everybody that they would have to try it eventually. On the 8th of July, the Battle for Calm began, German troops abandoning the town as ordered on the 10th of July. The front line was pulled back to the eastern bank of the Orne. The suburbs to the southeast of Caen therefore remained in German hands and blocked the Allied advance into the Falaise Plain. Our three company lay in the park of the Manneville Stud Farm, 2.5 kilometres from the Abteilung command post at Emmyville. The rearward tross was some distance away at Traun. In the second week of July, our commander Hauptmann Fromm was admitted to a military hospital in Paris for several days to have an inflamed eye wound treated. In his absence, Hauptmann Scherf took command of the Abteilung and I, as the senior lieutenant in the company, took over the fighting staffel of three company. I informed all panzer commanders of our future operational area and the various approach roads to the front line, so that we would know the local circumstances well. I pored over the map, trying to imagine every possibility the enemy might use for an attack, and imprinted the map as accurately as possible in my mind, for in action very much depends on it. Every fighting company of the Abteilung was scheduled for a 24-hour spell as alarm company, and had to be at immediate full readiness during this period. Initially, the front line remained quiet. We had made ourselves at home under the cover of ancient trees in the Manneville Park. A trench had been dug under each panzer. Some of the crew slept in the vehicle, the others below it. I always slept in the trench, for I could stretch out there. In the panzer, I would have to spend the night sitting in my commander's seat. Below the main building of the stud farm were cellars, where a dressing station had been set up by the Luftwaffe Field Division, which had been stationed here before us. My favourite place was the field kitchen, for food sets the mood of the company. The stud farm also had a market garden. The old gardener had decided to stay on, and I paid him a decent price in francs for large quantities of vegetables and salads, 
and from other sources more delicious ingredients of value in the kitchen. Our meals at this time were really excellent, and the three-company kitchen was highly regarded, with envy, by the whole Abtelung. Now and again a large barrel was filled with cider, and everybody could help himself from it, provided that he was not from that day's alarm company. In the evening the crews would frequently prepare extra dishes, especially fried potatoes and pudding. I would often be invited to join them, and one evening I had three invitations. There was no shortage of alcohol, and soon a stag party atmosphere would develop. Near the park was a field with wonderful new potatoes where Lieutenant Furlinger set up our flak protection. He was always a welcome guest at our parties. Unfortunately, he fell in Hungary in 1945. Those evenings in the open air were glorious, and we enjoyed the unexpectedly peaceful mood. Only rarely did one hear firing from the front only a few kilometres away. It reminded us that this idol would not last forever. Duty took me to Cannes on the 8th of July or thereabouts. The city was a sorry sight. The destruction inflicted by Allied bombing before the invasion was enormous. Only a few civilians had remained behind. By midday I was back with the company. When one looked west from high points in the countryside towards the sea, countless barrage balloons could be seen on the distant horizon. They served to defend the unprecedented assembly of warships of the Allied invasion fleet against the Luftwaffe. But what Luftwaffe? It was depressing to accept that our Luftwaffe was no longer capable of effective action. In the West, it had disappeared from the skies. That night there followed a renewed air attack on Carr. We could see the glow of the fires above the city. A terrible conflagration must be raging there. Here a different war was being fought from what we had known in the East. The enemy's air supremacy was undisputed. Next morning the battle for the city flared up. Our troops pulled out two days later. Now the front had edged closer to us. Towards five o'clock on the morning of the 11th of July, 1944, an Abtai Lung dispatch rider awoke me. Immediate alarm readiness. I was ordered to the Abtai Lung command post in person. In haste, I distributed my orders and rode there, pillion. Hauptmann Scherf explained the situation to me. After a brief heavy artillery bombardment, enemy forces, that was to say British armour and Canadian infantry, had broken through our main front line between Couverville and Colombelle and occupied the high ground north of the factory complex at Colombelle. Luftwaffe Jäger Regiment 32 had avoided contact with the enemy at Couverville, and the roads to Giberville and the region east of Caen now lay open to the enemy. A large number of tanks had been observed. My orders. Three Company is to destroy the enemy force, which has broken through by attacking it immediately. Restore the main front line and hold it awaiting further orders. The dispatch rider returned me to the company. The engines were warmed up, the crews in their panzers and the commanders were awaiting me at the command panzer. My instructions were soon passed on. Mount up, go to battle readiness, pull out. Thirty minutes after the alarm the company rolled at top speed for Gibberville. Actually, three company had not been the alarm company that night. The other two companies of the Abteilung had also been roused, but I had reached the command post first, and therefore three company received the assignment. The rest of the Abteilung remained at alarm readiness to see how things developed. We reached Giberville a quarter of an hour later. Here we were halted when the vibrations of the passing panzers caused a badly damaged house to collapse on top of the second vehicle. Nobody was hurt, but it had to be dug out first because the company could not pass the road being too narrow for more than one panzer at that point. It always happens when one is in a rush. I used the time to go by motorcycle to the northern end of Guyberville village to make contact with our units there. In the last house, a baker's shop, an artillery observation post of Sturmgeschutz Abt 200 was located below the roof. I went up and through the scissors telescope was shown a cluster of houses below St Honorine where a number of British Sherman tanks had taken up position. It must have been these which had forced out the grenadiers of the Luftwaffe Field Division. These were therefore our target. I returned to the company, assembled the commanders and gave my orders for the attack. Commanders sitting up, clear for battle. Scarcely had the first panzer, Lieutenant Copper, reached the northern exit from the village than he came under heavy fire. 
We came to a standstill for a moment, and then everything turned out wonderfully. I platoon under Oberfeld Rebel Sachs bore left, second platoon, Lieutenant Copper, bore right, leaving me in the centre between both platoons at the level. I had left a three platoon, Lieutenant Rambo, a little behind me in reserve. This spreading of the company was a major moment of weakness from the enemy point of view, and soon my panzer was receiving the first hits. No sooner were the other two platoons in position than they returned fire. By radio, I gave the order Überschlagender Einsatzes, in which one platoon advances at high speed under covering fire of the other platoon, the manoeuvre continuing alternately until something else is ordered. There was no reaction to my radio order, and I repeated it in a sharper tone of voice. Nothing changed, my panzers continued to engage the enemy from where they were. Thick black clouds of smoke were rising from the British tanks. Now and again I saw a stab of flame from an internal explosion. When the other panzers continued to ignore my order, I blew my top. If you don't attack at once, I shall turn my turret to six o'clock and fire behind me. Incredible. No reaction. All the time shells from the enemy tanks were hitting my panzer or whistling close above it. I could imagine more pleasant places to be. Just then I noticed through the viewing slit of my cupola that the wireless aerial had been shot away. I realised at once why my company was not responding. What to do now? I couldn't change panzers for one with an intact radio, and in any case my panzer was receiving too many hits. Therefore I was left with no choice but to attack. I went ahead at full speed for 300 Nm and received no hits. When I looked around I saw to my satisfaction that I platoon was following me, while two and thread platoons were stationary, giving covering fire. My platoon commanders had therefore grasped the situation and knew what to do without further orders. We now made the attack without radio communications. All movements were done automatically, as if on the exercise ground. One platoon gave covering fire, the other moved forward at top speed. There was nothing more to be seen of the enemy tanks, for the farmstead around which they had formed now lay behind a cloud of black smoke. The enemy infantry also retired behind a smoke screen, and when this had lifted somewhat, I saw the enemy tanks. Every round we fired hit a Sherman, which then burst into flames. Our panzers, on the other hand, had ceased to receive fire, and with one last 200 metres advance to the farmstead, I reached the old main front line. What I have just described lasted perhaps 30 minutes. The terrain offered little natural cover, and I arranged the company as best I could. Scarcely had we finished these movements than a British artillery spotter aircraft appeared high above us. This did not bode well, and soon we found ourselves at the centre of an artillery bombardment that robbed us of our senses of sight and hearing. It was as though gigantic peas were raining down upon us, ten impacts simultaneously. The ground shook and trembled as if in a great earthquake, and at once with so much dust and filth whirling around in the air, it became as dark as night. This lasted five minutes. We recovered quickly from the horror, even though we had never experienced anything like it before. I had never believed such a massive barrage possible. It fell quiet for an hour. I pulled us back 500 metres and then it started all over again. There was nothing we could do but keep our heads down in our panzers and sit it out. My tiger received a direct hit. We all felt the hefty blow. The lights failed and we were dazed for a few moments then surprised to find we were still alive. The British were firing with sensitive fuses, but luckily, shortly before leaving Germany, the turret had been given an additional layer of armour. Some of the welded seams had torn, which would require repairs once we got back. We were marooned there for over eight hours waiting for the relief to arrive, during which time the same bombardment was repeated several times. The British naval gunnery was so accurate that though we kept changing location, Every salvo straddled us while most of the shells exploded amongst us. Because we put a good distance between our panzers, we had no further losses. The artillery spotter aircraft, a slow propeller machine, kept contact with us until finally he ran short of fuel, and after that we had some peace. This gave me the opportunity to leave my panzer and have a closer look at the enemy tanks. Eleven Shermans strewn around and burnt out. Most were armed with 75mm guns, but a few were fireflies, with the heavier 17-pounder, which posed a greater threat to us. 
We had also destroyed five anti-tank guns. I noticed between the houses of the farmstead two totally undamaged Shermans which had collided and got locked together while trying to turn. These had then been abandoned by their crews. In one of the tanks I found a whole handful of material with plotted information, radio codes, orders and such like. I got these back by the quickest route to our Abteilung, which had set up an advanced command post on the railway line near Demouville. In the course of the morning, Hauptmann Fromm returned there from the Paris hospital, and upon hearing my report, he gave me the task of towing in both Shermans if it were possible. I drove forward and arrived just as the grenadiers of the Luftwaffe Field Division returned to reoccupy their old positions and relieve us. Lieutenant Copper led the company back to the Manaville stud farm. With my panzer and two drivers from the repair group, I remained forward to protect the Shermans. After a while, we got them running again. Under the eyes of the British, who were able to watch all this from nearby St. Honorine, we drove off proudly with the two Shermans. We considered this to be a triumph. The company had no casualties, and the damage to the panzers from hits was repairable. On the drive back, my column passed a troop of British tankmen made POWs that day. Wide-eyed, the poor fellows recognised their Shermans. Under interrogation later, they expressed their appreciation of our rules of engagement, for I had forbidden anybody to fire at tank crews abandoning their vehicles. We did not have long to enjoy our triumph. The next few days were not so tranquil, for in the park and around it, artillery and rocket launcher batteries had driven up and practised briefly now and again. The enemy's reply was never long in coming, and when they supported this with the ship's gunnery from offshore, it became more unpleasant for us, and we had to spend many hours in the hero's refuge below our panzers. There were many indications of a British offensive in the offing. After our success of the 11th of July, we believed we could handle it, but we really had no inkling of what we would be up against. The commanding officer had promised me the reward of a few days' leave in Paris, but unfortunately nothing came of it. Many years later I discovered from British sources what the purpose of their attack of the 11th of July, 1944, had been. On the 9th of July, the CO of 51st Highland Division, Major General Bullen Smith, had received orders to occupy the village of Colombelle with its factory complex and so enlarge the British bridgehead east of the Orne in preparation for Operation Goodwood. 153 Brigade under Brigadier Murray, reinforced by one squadron of Sherman tanks of 148th RAC, Royal Armoured Corps, and two platoons of 17-pounders of the 61st Anti-Tank Battalion, was detailed to carry out the attack. At six o'clock on the 11th of July, Major Wright of the brigade reported the appearance of my Tigers in front of his company. At 7.45, he reported that ten of the eleven Shermans had been destroyed in less than 45 minutes. At 8 o'clock, the CO, 153rd Brigade, broke off the attack and ordered a general retreat to St. Honorine. The divisional artillery of the Highlanders protected the withdrawal with a smokescreen. The British plan had failed. The panzers of Panzer Regiment 22 and two companies of Putzer Gren Regiment 192, which had been put on alarm status in the early morning, were no longer required. Our first engagement on the Normandy front was successful, but was only of local significance and could not influence the overall situation. The overall position on the invasion front in mid-July was quite favourable for us. The British were intent on changing this at all costs, to break through the static front lines and gain territory beyond. To achieve that, they needed to extract their armour from amongst the great hedgerows and sunken roads, favourable to the defenders, and reach the plains near Falaise, suitable for the deployment of their tanks. The crux of these wide-ranging British plans was the Bourgebus Heights, the key position for launching their operation, which lay eight kilometres east of the British bridgehead on the Orne. From there, the British would bring the German panzers and reserves to battle and wipe them out, and so clear the way to Paris. On the 18th of July, 1944, British 8th Corps with three armoured divisions, including the Guards Armoured Division, a total of 877 tanks, left the Orne bridgehead. The right and left flanks of the attack divisions were protected by one British and one Canadian corps. The attack was prepared by 2,077 bombers, 
which dropped 7,870 tonnes of bombs and 270 medium and heavy guns with 250,000 shells at their disposal. From 5.45 until 06301, 056 RAF heavy bombers attacked. Then from 7 o'clock until 07.30539 USAAF bombers. And from 8 o'clock to 8.30, another 482 USAAF bombers. Especially hard hit by this bombing preparation were the villages of Emmyville, Cagny and Manaville, where our three company lay. Never before had such an armada of bombers been used to soften up an enemy prior to an attack. By comparison, in February 1945, Dresden was attacked by only 1,054 RAF and USAAF bombers, which dropped 3,425 tonnes of bombs. At 8 o'clock, British 11th Armoured Division with 29th Armoured Brigade and 159th Infantry Brigade crossed the start line encountering no resistance because the advanced battalions of 16 Luftwaffe Field Division had been wiped out by the carpet bombing. At 8.30, the British spearheads crossed the Contrawan railway line. Here too, they met no resistance in front of the readiness area of heavy sapped 503. In the three-company readiness area, I was the premier, namely the I-platoon leader who was also the representative of the company commander, and what I said went. Hauptmann Scherf was lodging at the Abteilung command post in Emmyville. The mansion house there was quieter than our camp in the open. He was rarely to be seen at that time with the company's fighting staffel, but on the days between operations he had much to catch up on, going back and forth between the orderly room and the tross, including catering, the repair group and the workshop, all a fair stretch from each other. But back to the evening of the 17th of July. Lieutenant Herrlein, Abteilung Ordnance Officer, had invited all available officers to a party at the Abteilung Command Post. Soon after it started, it was interrupted by a fairly heavy artillery bombardment, which led to two dispatch riders being killed. Everything was broken off at once. I had been informed previously that a civilian had been shot dead on the front line, trying to cross over to the British side. On his body, the troops had found precise sketches of the company positions and the Abteilung command post. The commanding officer had immediately issued instructions for the Abteilung to move to another readiness area, for possibly other agents had managed to reach the British with similar sketches. But the high command, probably army group, had not approved the change of position. After the artillery bombardment, I drove back to the company as fast as possible to find all quiet. Therefore, I did not know how to interpret the artillery bombardment. It had been heavier than usual. Was it merely a nuisance barrage or several batteries zeroing in before a major operation? There was no way of telling. I inspected the sentries, warned them to wake me if anything strange happened, crawled under my panzer, wrapped myself in my blanket and was soon asleep. My companion in the slit trench beneath Tiger 311 was Unteroffizier Workmeister, my gunner, the other three crewmen slept inside the panzer. I was awoken at six o'clock by the sound of many aircraft engines, crept out of the trench and through the foliage saw Christmas trees in various colours, slowly sinking to the ground. Target marker flares for bombers, I thought at once, but I had no more time to reflect. Two hundred metres from our wood, a series of great fountains of earth and smoke reared up and I was struck by a violent pressure wave which almost hurled me to the ground. Seconds later, I was back beneath the panzer, and not a moment too soon, for a second stick of bombs fell much nearer. The panzer shook and my eardrums hurt with the pressure. I realised at once that this attack was aimed at us personally. From now on I could not think. I was as helpless as a drowning man tossed into raging seas. The air was filled with the whistle of falling bombs, and instinctively I pressed myself closer to the ground. Then followed the deafening explosions and attendant air pressure, increasingly louder as the chain of explosions ran its course towards us. Each aircraft dropped not a single bomb, but a batch of 15 or 20. The bombers came in staggered formations of 10 to 15 aircraft, all dropping their bomb loads simultaneously, wave after wave. The ground trembled. It surprised me that I could have survived it. I had a feeling of total helplessness in the presence of these explosive forces. There was no running away from them. 
I had no idea how long the bombing would go on. All idea of time was lost. It seemed an eternity since I had lain peacefully asleep under my panzer. Suddenly, Werkmeister and I were catapulted by the blast into a corner of the trench, covered over with earth, and were probably unconscious for some time until we came to. The blast had swept away the excavated earth which we had lined alongside the tracks and wheels, and so I could now see out through the wheels. My neighbouring panzer was ablaze. Tiger 312, Unteroffizier Westerhausen's panzer, had received a direct hit. That was all I could see from my slit trench, although I realised that the blast had shifted my own panzer slightly to one side. Probably the near miss which knocked us out had caused it. Then it all started again. Down came the next shower of bombs. As I seem to remember, the whole performance lasted two and a half hours with short pauses. It would be superfluous to repeat the same event occurring over and over. I lay under my panzer with my fingers in my ears and bit my blanket so as not to cry out. Finally, the attack seemed to come to an end. What a sight met my eyes as I crawled out from under my panzer. Of the once so beautiful parkland, nothing remained but shredded trees, churned meadows and giant bomb craters so numerous that they overlapped. A grey, repulsive moonscape and a mist of dust which made breathing difficult. Through the thick fog, it was possible to see the red glow of trees and cornfields burning. That was my first impression as I stood behind my panzer and had a look around. It was incomprehensible how the surroundings had changed. Then life returned. The crews crept out of their slit trenches under the panzers, or from within them, pale and bewildered, more suspecting than knowing how close to death they had been. I went to the panzer on our right. It had received a direct hit and looked like a giant opened sardine tin. Flames licked the wreckage. Of Unteroffizier Westerhausen and his crew, there was no trace. I worked my way through a veritable primeval woodland, and now came to the gigantic crater in front of Oberfeldwebel Sachs's Tiger 313. The panzer itself had been flipped over by the blast, and now lay on its turret, wheels in the air. We found two crewmen dead under it, and of the other three there was no trace. Where my frontline repair group had been was only a crater. There would have been five or six men who had sought shelter beneath their two panzers, but now they could not be found. The platoon leaders arrived, still confused. We had no time to discuss what we had just lived through, however. Now we had to act. We had to restore our panzers to operational status, but most of them first had to be shoveled free from the earth piled up to the turret. Some had fallen trees across them and their tracks broken. With our few tools aboard, two shovels and a pickaxe per panzer, how were we to get the company operational again? Additionally, the work had to be broken off frequently, when salvos from heavy artillery, probably naval guns, targeted our area. The men made a superhuman effort, for we knew now that it was life or death. I also noticed that 10M behind my panzer was a crater 6-8 metres deep, which would have swallowed it up comfortably. If the bomb had landed a fraction of a second later, it would have been a direct hit, and these memoirs would never have been written. The thick armour plate over the engine at the rear of the panzer had been deformed as though hit by a bomb that had failed to explode. Upon examination, we established that the cooling unit had been damaged by blast. My panzer was therefore not combat-worthy, and I had to change vehicles again. Our situation was now fairly difficult. We could hear tank guns and MGs firing not too far off. Had the British broken through and were they already close? I had not been able to restore radio contact with Abteilung and had no idea how they might have got on. I also had no idea who on our defensive front would still be in a position to repulse a British attack after the murderous bombardment. In order to clarify the situation, I set off on foot for Abteilung. The whole time, enemy artillery fire was incessant, much louder than before, and the shelling reaching much closer to us. I jumped from crater to crater always with an eye for cover whenever I heard a fresh salvo whistling over. Thus my progress was laborious, what with the tree trunks and great craters I had to surmount. Finally I reached the path which led along the boundary of the parkland to Emmyville. There were fewer bomb-pitted areas here and the going was easier. From behind a bend in the road, the Tiger One of Hauptmann Frome came towards me. 
I reported the status of the company, and he ordered me to get it out of the readiness area as soon as possible, and set up a defensive front on the left flank of the suspected British attack corridor between Manaville and Cagny. This would prevent a breakthrough in the direction of Emmyville. At first, it remained uncertain how long the company would need before it could move out. The noise of fighting from the west had grown so loud, meanwhile, that I could not be sure that the British would allow me the time to restore operational readiness. I could hear a great droning sound as if a large number of vehicles were moving from north to south, but nothing could be seen. A delicate veil of smoke lay over the land. I hurried back to the company, taking cover whenever the heavy calibre naval shells howled over, whirling splinters and clumps of earth everywhere when they exploded. At company, it still looked unpromising. The least damaged was Lieutenant Rambo's three platoon. Three Tigers of my I platoon were write-offs, and work was going all out on the fourth. Two platoon reported the hope of having three Panzers operational soon. My main concern was whether we could beat the British to it. If their tanks arrived right now in this readiness area, we would have to attempt to evade capture using close combat weapons. The operational panzers went to the park entrance gate. It was difficult to steer these mighty and to some extent cumbersome tigers between the giant craters. Anybody who has seen woodland after a hurricane, with giant trees lying everywhere, can perhaps imagine how the once well-cared-for park now looked. We still kept hearing the noise of vehicles nearby. Between it, the reports of tank guns and the clatter of MG fire, though these noises of battle seemed to be coming from much further afield. Had the British already passed us by? Where were German troops? Had the carpet bombing wiped them all out? We had no contact with any of them, either by radio or messenger. It might have been about ten o'clock, perhaps later, when we had six panzers roadworthy. They were still listed for the workshop, but at least running and, so I believed, could fire their guns. I have no idea which number panzer I boarded. The main thing was, we were rolling. After 1.5 kilometres along the park wall, we were held up southwest of Manaville. Two of my panzers had engine fires and could only follow at a slow speed. Around 11 o'clock, we saw two Shermans advancing through a depression, carrying out reconnaissance against us. It was only then that we discovered more damage to our panzers from the carpet bombing than had been detected earlier. We opened fire with our guns but fired wide. The blast had decalibrated them. Where one round had been sufficient before, now we needed three. Where we had parked was also not ideal. Our view was obstructed by hedges and bushes, so that although we were to some extent under cover, we could only use our firepower with difficulty. In order to have a better field of fire, we shifted our position, for to judge by the noises, the British corridor through which they were making inroads had to run immediately in front of us. My aim was to attack them in the flank. Going around a small wood, the company drove at first to the southwest in the direction of Cagny, from where it would then turn west to the Lepria farmstead. That, at any rate, was the plan. During the manoeuvre, there were two sharp explosions one after the other. Feldwebel Schunrock's panzer burst into flames. It had been penetrated by a hit from ahead, as had the panzer of Feldwebel Müller. We retrieved the wounded and took them on the rear of a panzer to the nearby dressing station at Manneville. The worst case was Unterofficier Matis, with severe burns. The other tigers pulled back 200 metres on my orders and took up fresh positions. We did not know exactly from where the fire had come. As both panzers had received frontal hits, the shells must have been fired from Cagny, 1,200 metres ahead of us. But at this time, Cagny was in German hands. It was one puzzle after another, for until then we knew of no British weapon which could penetrate the frontal armour of a tiger. At last I had finally managed to restore radio contact with Fromm, the Abteilung commander. He was with the panzers of the Abteilung HQ very near the Manneville Chateau. Hauptmann Scherf was also there with his Tiger 300. Since it had fallen quiet in my vicinity, I walked there and reported the status of my company. Two Tigers total write-offs after frontal penetration, guns decalibrated, engine fires due to failure of cooling systems. We also had 16 dead. All our panzers ought to have been at the repairers. But in this situation in the face of the enemy we had to act for as long as possible, 
as though we were capable of a really serious resistance. From there, I went to the main dressing station again. Unteroffizier Mattis looked dreadfully mutilated. He had been given injections, but I doubt if he recognised me. He died a short time later. I went back to our previous readiness area. The crews of the panzers abandoned there had meanwhile been brought out by our tross. I looked over the panzers. My 311 could really have been towed out. The damage to the other panzers was too serious. Oberfeldwebel Sachs 313 lay upside down. This 58-ton panzer had been simply blown over. What forces this bombardment had unleashed? I still could not believe what had swept over us there. Where my frontline repair group had been earlier, I found a 20-litre canister of cold tea. I shouldered it and returned to my company. They had nothing to report. We were grateful for the tea in the midday heat. Towards 16 o'clock, Hauptmann Fromm ordered three company to decamp, recovering those panzers still capable of repair with the available tools. I put together a towing platoon. The roadworthy panzers, mostly those with external bomb damage, towed the ones immobilised by engine or running gear damage. While the towing platoon went off to our rearward services at Rupierre, I returned with my Tiger to our readiness area to try to tow out my 311. While my crew set to work with a will under great pressure of time, I looked over the other stranded panzers, which included Saxe's 313. The upside-down monster was quite impressive. Some of the wheels had been dislodged and the tracks ripped off. As I stood behind it staring, it struck me that the emergency exit hatch on the turret, which could only be opened from inside, was a few centimetres ajar. This hatch was so constructed that if opened from inside, the weight of the lid would cause it to open fully. Because the panzer lay on its turret, the hatch could not be opened, and a great lifting force would be necessary to raise the panzer first. Anybody still inside the fighting compartment was therefore trapped. I climbed up to the small gap of the partly open hatch and called inside. As if by some miracle I got an answer. I found that my attempts to open the hatch any wider were fruitless, and summoned three men to help. With our combined force, we got the hatch open and shored it up with a thick wooden beam. Oberfeld Webel Sachs was the first to emerge, then the gunner, and finally the driver. All had bruises and contusions, and burns from contamination with battery acid. They had been unconscious for some hours, then awoke to find themselves in an overturned panzer, hopelessly trapped and wedged in, and we brought them out more dead than alive. Now it was high time for us all to get out of there. The Abteilung had gone to clear up a breach in the line near Cagny, and a new defensive front had been set up about 5km further back. I was not aware of this, and scouted first of all a route wide enough for a tow, and when darkness fell I got my Tiger 311 towed away with the greatest difficulty. Obergefreiter Seal distinguished himself especially, steering the panzer despite his serious burns. Shortly after we had vacated the park, the British arrived to occupy it. Once again I had come through unscathed. A British report attributes the failure of their forces to capture Cagny until the late afternoon of the 18th of July, much later than their planning had allowed, to the attack on the left flank of their advance by six Tigers of heavy supped 503, which had miraculously survived the carpet bombing. The Wehrmacht report for the 24th of July 1944 states, Having joined the Tross at Rupierre, I rolled myself in my blanket under a large tree and slept and slept. On the 19th of July, I saw to it that my panzers went into the workshop. Then I received the commanding officer's order that I was to take three days convalescent leave in Paris. I shook hands with him and anybody else I saw in delight at this well-deserved pause in the fighting. Oberleutnant Dr. Barkhausen, the Abteilung adjutant, came along too. He knew Paris well from his student years and was an excellent tour guide. Our departure on the morning of the 20th of July was delayed for having celebrated too much the previous evening with the workshop company, and upon awaking we found ourselves not yet fit to travel. At midday we set off for Paris in the Volkswagen full of expectations. A wonderful journey completed in three hours. How did we get there? The co-driver sat on the right-hand mudguard looking backwards to keep an eye on the sky for enemy aircraft. The driver and passengers kept watch ahead. On this run we were not molested by aircraft, 
although apparently the enemy fighter bombers were all over Normandy. We lodged at the Hotel Commodore on Boulevard Hausmann, a Wehrmacht hotel. Barkhausen went with me that first evening to the Lapin Agile on Montmartre. It was a really highbrow literary cabaret. I had been expecting to see a bit more flesh, but such cheap pleasure was not on Dr. Barkhausen's agenda. When we got back to Boulevard Hausmann towards 22 o'clock, we were approached by some ladies of the night, and from them we learned of the attempt to assassinate Hitler. They also told us that at that moment in Paris, the SS was being arrested by the Wehrmacht. It was amazing that the news could have got round so fast. What were my feelings at hearing this news? It had less effect on me than its far-reaching consequences might have led one to expect. Nobody knew anything for certain. It was all just rumours. Finally, we learned, without further details, that the attempt had failed. I have to confess that the entire event, the fact of the attempt and its failure, excited my interest very little at first, although I did feel a certain satisfaction at the arresting of the SS. Not at the front, but in the Etappe, the occupied areas between the front lines and the Reich. As here, there were substantial reservations about the presence and preferential treatment shown to the SS. In the Etappe, however, there were also substantial reservations about service centres of all kinds for us Frontschwein. Despite what one may imagine about how it was then, in Paris for the first time, we were captivated by the flair of the city. After the fighting in Normandy only two days previously, it was marvellous and beautiful in an unreal way with its easy living, its pleasures, its elegance, its peaceful appearance, life and work. All we wanted to do at that moment was experience it and enjoy it. In those first few hours, I was like a peasant farmer visiting a great city for the first time. And once it had begun to sink in, I acclimatised very quickly to the environment both inwardly and outwardly. We visited all the must-see tourist attractions. Les Invalides, the Louvre, Jeux de Pomme, Notre Dame, Sacré-Cœur de Montmartre, Palais de Trocadero and the Eiffel Tower. In the flea market at the Porte de Clignancourt. I spent all the cash I had on things to send home, finally even buying a bolt of cloth which I exchanged when the money ran out. The first two days passed very quickly, and on the morning of the third day we were supposed to set off back. To my great surprise, Hauptmann Scherf appeared at the hotel to inform me that three company was to pass all its available panzers to two company before transferring to the troop training depot at Maly le camp near Chalon, where it would receive an issue of new tigers. Leutnant Copper was handling the transfer of the company and was expected with the company in Paris in a few days on the way to Maly. During the period of rest and recuperation, we would be attached to Panzerbrig X at Reims, and Hauptmann Scherf drove me there at once to make contact. On the drive, he revealed that he was being transferred and would probably be taking over another Tiger Abteilung, and, what was more important for me, that I would become company leader of three company. An advance party from the company went to Meli, myself following two days later. I found that the best possible preparations had been made there. A day later, I was ordered back to Paris in order to organise the delivery of our new panzers with HQ West, Transport Command, and all other imaginable useful or superfluous administrative offices. The paper war had blossomed, and especially in Paris, a great number of offices needed to justify their existence. Our expected panzers had not yet left Germany, and therefore we had a few days free. So as to give the soldiers of our company something of Paris, Hauptmann Scherf allowed the transport from Normandy to Maily to pause for two days in the French capital. The men could stroll the streets in small groups and see the sights. They were accommodated in the chateau at Vincennes. At the training depot, we were given space to bivouac near the village of Sompuis. At the beginning of August, three companies' panzers arrived. They were the newest version of the Tiger, SDK FS 182, the Tiger II, King Tiger. A large amount of their equipment was missing, and a squad was dispatched at once to Germany to fetch it. I sent one of the lorries to pass through Rastatt to drop off my purchases from the flea market. Meanwhile, we worked all out to get the new panzers operational. The days were filled with painting on the camouflage scheme and turret numbers, running them in and calibrating the weapons. 
Meanwhile, a group of photographers from the propaganda company came by to snap the daily routine of an operational panzer company. While doing so, the panzers of Feldwebel Seidel and Unterofizier Jackal suffered damage to the engine and gears, respectively. I went forward again to the Abteilung command post in order to report to the commanding officer in person on the status and difficulties of our refresher period. On this journey, I came into contact for the first time with the French resistance movement, the Maquis. There was some danger, but I came out of it unscathed. Nevertheless, my impression after this journey was that the situation looked anything but rosy. At the command post, I heard the broadcast of the speech by Dr. Robert Ley, who, as head of the German Arbeitsfront, was one of the most unpleasant firebrands. This was his notorious speech following the 20th of July, in which he characterised the nobility as blue-blooded Schweinehunder, and made some frightening threats. I was disturbed and shocked. We discussed it. Fromm said in his dry way, Young man, don't let it get to you. We shall protect you. Meanwhile, the names of some of the group of assassins of the 20th of July had been made known. The greater part of them came from old noble families, which irritated me. I could not believe that these men would have acted from pure self-interest or whatever other reason had been put forward by officialdom. Much more likely, the most serious reasons lay behind it. Whatever it was, it had nothing to do with me. It was a pity that Rommel was out of action after his severe wound of the 17th of July. We had great faith in him. A word from him now would have helped us greatly. I discussed my fears with Hauptmann Wiegand, head of the supply company, Oberleutnant Dr. Barkhausen, our adjutant, and also with Hauptmann von Eichel Streiber, commanding officer of two company. We were in shreds inwardly, but we could see no way out of the hopeless situation, neither for the German Volk nor for ourselves personally. Nevertheless, at the centre of all considerations was the urgent need to get the company operational as quickly as possible, for it was needed at the front. We knew that no turn of the military tide was going to come, and that the leaders could no longer deceive us with their all-too-transparent pleas to hold out until it did so. What we did hope, however, was that by fighting on we might be able to force an honourable armistice. This became the new catchphrase. For that reason, we were prepared to keep all our forces active. We also spoke frequently of the idea that after the war, first of all, there would have to be a good clear-out of the interior. After the 20th of July, the Wehrmacht had found itself on the defensive. Everything was moving towards an SS state. Himmler had been appointed commander of the Reserve Army, so that the personnel office, training and the officers' schools were all under his direction. The Wehrmacht was ordered henceforth to use the Hitler salute. The military salute was abolished. This affected us deeply, for the latter was what distinguished us outwardly from the Waffen-SS. We held them in high esteem as outstanding troops, but for us they were the Nazi Party's army, and we did not want to be that under any circumstances.